Week three, instant reactions. That's a wrap. Typically, I go to 444's John Daigle to give a little recap of overarching thoughts on the day. I'll do it, Daigle, this time. If you think you know, you have no idea, unless it's the Miami Dolphins offense, because holy crap. It was wild stuff. I mean, we'll, we'll get to it when we talk to them, but I didn't see a Broncos defender the entire game. Yeah. Mike McDaniel, Patrick Mahomes, and Kyle Shanahan, the three people making football mm -hmm. watchable in 2023. Mm -hmm. All right. What we do today, we go through every single game on Thursday and on Sunday in the 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock windows, bring you the details that you might have missed along the way, the usage that really matters to us. And we'll kick it off. Chargers versus Vikings. Yes, with the Chargers beating the Vikings, improving now with their first win of the season, one and two, that score, 28 to 24, came down to a nail biter. 40 of 47, Justin Herbert, 405 yards and three scores. And how we got there was so very Vikings and Chargers. <laughs> Justin Jefferson, no targets in the first quarter at mm. all, but finally gets the ball in the second quarter. And of course, on two back to back plays, 21 yard catch and a 34 yard catch. Fast forward though, because it starts really heating up and goes full Minnesota and LA around the mid second quarters when we start really seeing what these teams are. Keenan Allen has a big catch at that point. And then that's what's set up. Keenan Allen motioning behind the line of scrimmage and the replay probably everyone has seen by now. Allen catching a backward pass from Herbert and then hitting Mike Williams for a big 51-yard touchdown. On the next series, on fourth and six, needing any kind of help to answer the Chargers. Kirk Cousins just flings it up and finds K.J. Osborne on a crossing route for a 36-yard touchdown. But let's fast forward a little bit to the end because then it goes full on everything you expect from this game everything we talked about throughout the week. The, Vi the Vikings missed an easy interception at the end, which went ahead and gave Josh Palmer the go-ahead touchdown. But in being Minnesota and not going away, they did find Justin Jefferson deep on the ensuing, on the ensuing drive. They were brought into the five-yard line at that point, and then with roughly four minutes to play, their next four plays on first and goal from the three-yard line go. Yeah. Alexander Madison, two-yard carry. Alexander Matt, Madison for a loss of one. Kirk Cousins short of Justin Jefferson and incomplete. And then Cousins basically a full two yards shy of anyone in the area to go four and out from that spot. The Chargers get the ball back then uh, up by four from their own three yard line. Move it out to their 24 yard line with a big play and eventually reach fourth and one with 147 remaining. And our hero, Brandon Staley, proves he has not been broken by the media just yet. Unfortunately, they call a handoff to Josh Kelly, who was lined up at the fullback position, and he, of course, runs directly into his center's ass and gets stuffed short. So now the Vikings have the ball down by four at, their, at the Chargers' 24-yard line with 147 remaining. And then all they need is a touchdown to go up. Cousins tosses to Brandon Powell, and Justin Jefferson cramps up because, of course, we're still in Vikings mode. We're not done with all the shenanigans yet. Cousins throws to T.J. Hawkinson next, who takes a big hit, and we thought he was out, but he just kind of toughed it out, pulled, pulled himself up, and got back in the game, caught a nine-yard pass the very next play, and then Cousins starts hurrying it along at the goal line, and with only 15 seconds remaining, then looks for Osborne crossing, and the pass was tipped by two defenders, and it lands in Kenneth Murray's hand in the end zone for a game-losing interception. And that's how we reached the end of this one. The Vikings, who finished 11-0 in one-score games last year, yep. are now 0-3 in one-score games because life comes at you fast. What I was looking at for the snap counts, and I hope they change this now that they're 0-3, Jordan Addison was still playing behind KJ Osborne. Jordan Addison took a while until like the third and fourth quarter. He started getting peppered with targets. Uh, nothing too... Uh, downfield for him. He still was like a totally fine start, six for 52, with no scores. Um, but I mean, at some point, we got to get uh, my boy Jordan Addison in there at full time. Well, and it's interesting because via the box score, it would look totally different than that remark because Jordan Addison has eight targets, six receptions, 52 yards. As you mentioned, Daigle, that single KJ Osborne catch went for 36 yards and a score, and that was only on three targets. I mean, it's pretty crazy. And we talked about how you can basically attack the Chargers defense in multiple phases, and they did that. I mean, Kirk Cousins dropped back 50 times, completed 32 for three touchdowns, was sacked four times. Mm -hmm. Then you also go out there and give 25 touches 
to Alexander Madison. And yes, the box score will indicate that he had 125 yards. But Daigle, he also got extremely lucky that his forward progress was quote unquote stopped, that he fumbled near the goal line and it didn't mm -hmm. count and so on and so forth. Again, despite a 125 yard effort, this Cam Akers move is on my radar. And it's not just a Madison thing, but I don't think he creates anything on his own to bring to the table that is an added element now for an 0-3 Vikings team that didn't give him that much money to like keep him from not getting rug pulled. 86% of the team's running back touches, but again, what does that matter, to your point, when Cam Akers is active next week? So it's probably not even worth discussing his performance because it's about to become a timeshare at best. Okay, well, let's talk about the Chargers then because the Vikings blitz Justin Herbert on 40 of his 50 dropbacks. That's the second highest blitz rate in the next-gen stats era, 82%. He averaged just a 2.26 seconds of time to throw, the first of under 2.4 in his career. And like I said, Daigle, at the top, 40 of 47, 4 of 5, three touchdowns. Huge day for Keenan Allen, who we see in this C.D. Lamb-esque role with 20 targets, 18 receptions, 215 yards. But this injury to Mike Williams could cloud how this pass game is unfolded in the future. What did we learn after he left with an injury, Daigle? The Chargers had 10 dropbacks from the time Mike Williams got carted off the field in the, into the third quarter through overtime. And of those 10 dropbacks, Keenan Allen and Josh Palmer ran a route on 100%. Of the dropbacks, Quentin Johnson just three, 30 percent, and then Darius Davis behind him. So, so far, we are seeing Josh Palmer play significantly, as they told us in the preseason, over Quentin Johnston. Does that matter long term? Probably not. Before the short, short term, I would imagine Josh Palmer is still very much the option to pick up on waivers. Yeah, I mean, the Keenan Allen stuff was absolutely ridiculous 20 targets, 18 receptions for 215 yards. It was just Teach tape. There's some of the releases that I saw from the broadcast angle that were absolutely lethal. He's the easy button when they don't have Keenan Allen, but he or uh, without Austin Eckler, but he also was working a little bit more intermediate stuff. I, I do think that Mike Williams' injury is a really big one, though. They need Quinta Johnson or Josh Palmer to step up as the deep threat, or else we're going to have the kind of Justin Herbert uh, underneath stuff. But this was what I was seeing down the field just sideline shot after sideline shot. And if we're looking at sideline shots, I understand that many build Quentin Johnson as like a vertical, excuse me, a yards after catch pass catcher. You and mm -hmm. I, Hayden, have more of a belief in him as a vertical playmaker who can win off play action and get behind defenses. Josh Palmer has like been hit or miss throughout his career, like extremely hit or miss. But it's obvious that they view him as a two wide receiver set player, as you just outlined. And this is the pathway, though, for a rookie like. Dago, do we have any updates on the status of Mike Williams? I know he was carted to the, I think, the locker room, to the sideline, the blue tent, all that type of stuff. It just looks bad all around. It does look like a few weeks, only x-rays at this point, as far as I've seen. And yes, it's obviously a pass-heavy offense. I think that's the key here, is that they could have attacked Flores on the ground, but instead we come away with just 17 running back carries still to 45 pass attempts, which is much more similar to their approach on offense in week two, as opposed to week one when they had an all offseason to think about how to handle Vic Fangio in Miami. Can we talk through that Josh Kelly stuff? Because I'm sure everyone's I mean, at the end of their line. You know, I mean, it's 11 carries for 12 yards, a long run of four. He adds one catch on one target once again for five yards. We've had a bad matchup against the Titans. What should be a better matchup, but it's, I think, kind of clear what Kellen Moore will do now without Austin Eckler, which might be the case through the bye, where it gets to the point of, hey, if we don't have this elite running back, why not just air it out with our elite quarterback and really good pass catchers and just abandon the run completely? And 86% of running back touches. That's at least nice. But the fact that he rushed for 11 yards on those 12 carries, uh, not great. Total 17 yards on his 12 touches overall as well. So we aren't we aren't getting it right now. I know they say Austin Eckler's close. I don't believe them. With the bye in week five, I would imagine they still sit him in week four. Yeah, look, 75% snaps for Joshua Kelly. just uninvolved. He's not even running that many routes. I think what happened with his receptions this week is because they blitzed so much, he was staying in there to practice, pass protect, but he's like very clearly not a focal point. And the way that Justin Herbert's playing right now, out of control football, in my opinion, and the way that Keenan Allen is playing, um, I, I can't blame Kellen Moore. By the way, the, the Chargers are going to be top three in like all the numbers, EPA, success rate, all, all, all that stuff after these first three weeks. Um, they're going to be one and two. And Donald Parham comes down with two so in zone, red zone touchdowns. Yeah. And uh, 
tilts everything. Let's put it that way in his direction. All right. Let's send on over to a, a 70 burger. Yes. 70 points were scored by the Miami Dolphins this week. Broncos versus Dolphins. 14 points in the first quarter, 21 points in the second quarter, 14 points in the third quarter, 21 points in the fourth quarter. The 3-0 and Miami Dolphins put up, I believe, the third highest score of all time, and they could have tied the record, but Mike McDaniel elects not to kick a field goal on Sean Payton's ass this week to make that 73 points. Talk me through this. Hayden, because uh, it's not very often we get a team posting 70 points on another professional organization. Most yards in NFL history, 726. Third ever team to have 70-plus points. The other uh, teams were playing in the 50s and 60s. Um, they averaged 9.8 yards per play, and it was doing it in both phases. Uh, as a team, they forced 21 missed tackles. The Broncos' wow. defense was embarrassing. They lacked effort. They lacked speed. And some just crazy stats here as we're looking at this passing chart from Tua, who like didn't miss a throw the entire game, was consistently throwing the ball over the middle like this. It seemed like the Broncos were just unprepared for what this Dolphins offense is. Like the Tua throws to Tyreek Hill, every single one of Tyreek Hill's uh, catches today was on an in-breaking route. And this is what we've talked about. Throwing the ball over the middle is the most efficient play. How I'm viewing this offense, it kind of reminds me of like the Warriors in basketball when they started their dynasty where – it's very clear that throwing the ball over the middle and deep downfield with this much speed is very advantageous, as was the three-pointer. And they have a, someone like Tua that's playing exactly perfect for this. Uh, the running backs obviously had the absolutely most bonkers box scores of all time. <laughs> it was the highest scoring running back pairing of all time. Uh, Raheem Mostert, he got it done first. He was pulled in the third quarter. By that point, he already had a bunch of touchdowns. He forced five tackles on the ground, five tackles in the air. He had about six targets right off the bat, so he was still playing for the most uh, of the game. But Adrian was getting in there perfect. And I think that this will probably be one of the biggest storylines of the week. I thought it was the best scheming to a running back like Adrian that I've ever seen before. Adrian was fantastic himself. He was bouncing off blockers despite his uh, size. He was obviously a speed demon right now. The the, the Dolphins have the all top five of next gen's fastest ball carries of the season all play for the Miami Dolphins and some of the play calling to get a chain into the red zone was phenomenal. They ran this play for two different touchdowns where they'd have a, a player coming in reverse and then a little play action to a chain. And then Tua would do kind of the Kansas city chiefs little flick uh, to a chain who basically goes untouched into the end zone. They were giving pitches to a chain out in space to take advantage of, of his speed. There was reverses to take advantage of his speed. So when every other NFL coach talks about how they're going to scheme up their players and put them in the best uh, matchups, nobody is even close to doing it. What McDaniel's doing right now. It's just with Tyree kill. It's with Tua. It's with Raheem Mostert. And today it was Devon a chain. So uh, credit to McDaniel. I think he's the best coach in the league right now. Everything was wide open Dev, Devon A chain 5.1 yards before contact. Um, wow. that, that'll get it done. I just want to show this play real quick because it is showing, you know, just motion across with Braxton Berrios at the number zero, as you can see. Then we get a fake to 31 where he mows her in this direction. Then you get a jet sweep to Devon A chain also working behind Tua as a handoff. And what that allows you to do, one, there's only about two players out here. And you get number 11 as a blocker. But first, the motion, the initial motion with Braxton Berrios as a lead blocker out in front with Devon A. Chain. And then he's just off the races. Great downfield blocking, few missed tackles, cut the seam down the field, and he's gone. I mean, we saw the pony personnel unlocked a little bit, like a peak of it for last week with Raheem Mostert and Salvin Ahmed. And this week, the door completely was wide open to the tune of 18 carries, 203 yards, two touchdowns for Devon Aching on the ground, just on the ground, where he most hurt 13 carries, 82 yards, and three touchdowns. Then in the air, shovel passes, screens, dump offs, seven catches, 60 yards, and a score for Raheem Mostert. Four receptions, 30 yards, and two touchdowns. When we get performances like this, where two guys basically get four touchdowns and like over 50 fantasy points for you, it's... Hey, run the races. We want to start these guys every single week. We're not going to see 70 points each week, but try to put, you know how often we like put bad performances into context. 
Can you try to put this good performance into context for the rest of the season? Does that make sense? It does, but in doing this long term for such a long tom time, all I can think about is Jeff Wilson coming back in week five. So how do we add him into the mix if we're thinking about that? And then what about when Jalen Waddle comes back? Because that was my question. Who gets the targets? And what we saw was Tyreek Kill 39% target share and the running backs, A-Chain and Mostert combined for a 39% target share. That was the answer with no one else mattering. It was just between three players on offense. That's the most amazing part about it. I think the Dolphins every single week will be projected from 27 to 32 points. I think the, the betting markets will take like this. Obviously, you have to take this into massive account here. My question is, is like Raheem Mostert, like I don't see them getting rid of him. Like he was getting the goal line stuff. They were scheming him up. They're using him in the pass game stuff. Like I think Raheem Mostert for the rest of the season, he could be viewed as a top 10 guys. We're losing all of our stud running backs to injuries. 18 is going to be a little, little bit scarier, but like there is this, when I'm doing my rankings, like running back 25 to running back 35, you get your Jets guys in there. You get your Ravens guys in there. You get your Broncos running backs in there. Like to me, the second running back definitely could be, in that flex uh, appeal, just because this offense is so damn explosive. It's like P Ryan versus a chain. Like at this point, like obviously you're going to be wanting to roster a chain. We'll just have to see what happens with Jeff Wilson. But I mean, my God, this is McDaniel just playing like out of his mind. The Broncos literally, when you watch this game, the Broncos were not within the defense or the offensive player for like seven yards downfield. Like every single play, it was, it was incredible to watch. Look, again, 70 points are not scored very often. Maybe a little motivation when Sean Payton was on his media duties last year talking about Tua Tungavailo and his performances. If you go and check it out, I won't pull it all up, but the quarterback collective uh, who, you know, the Mike McDaniels, the Kyle Shanahan's, the Sean McVay's, the Matt LaFleur's go out with Mike Shanahan during the offseason and really try to groom these young quarterbacks. It was just Miami Dolphins propaganda. How dare you question all this stuff? Retweets over and over and over again. Even Chris Brooks, the third string running back, got nine carries for 66 yards. <laughs> this chosen Anderson had a 68 yard touchdown from Mike White. Yeah, that explains it was, everything. It was nonstop. It was literally he was, nonstop. He was shadowed by Patrick Sertain, too, and chosen Anderson beat him by two yards over the top. Oh. Josh, I, I just want to say on the other side, too, they didn't pull Russ. Like, the, it was just take your embarrassment. You're out there down 50 points. Like, we don't care. Russell Wilson, it was just all deep balls. Cortland Sutton, he led the team with 11 targets, 91 yards, had a touchdown, had also a touchdown drop, also had two fumbles. So everything's super inconsistent from the Broncos. They get Marvin Mims in there for another splash play. I think uh, Marvin Mims also had a long touchdown on a return. Yeah, 121 uh, kick return yards, including a 99-yard touchdown. So they need to get Marvin Mims in there. But if you're just like looking at Sean Payton versus McDaniel, just like the scheme and stuff, what they're talking about, like it's play action deep balls for Russ. And then it's like everything that you can ever want crossing the formation. They had 49 snaps using pre-stat motion for the Dolphins. Like right. everything that we talk about, pre-stat motion, RPOs, play action, throwing the ball over the middle, throwing the ball downfield, throw, uh, not running the ball up the middle, using the speed. You're getting every single piece of that for the Dolphins. I'm not sure we can say that about an offense ever, ever before. Yeah, that's Dolphins how up next. Go ahead, Diggle. I was going to say, that's how Mims earns more playing time too. Hayden is not only that Cortland Sutton drop touchdown, but Sutton also two fumbles in this game. Brandon Johnson called for three penalties, two, which took back touchdowns and one that took back up back a first down in the second half. Uh, if he keeps playing like he did and he, again, he only ran 11 routes today. He is still just not being used at all. But if you keep playing like this, and everyone else who they tried to trade this offseason keeps messing up and making errors. You will find your way in the lineup sooner than later. Yeah, Broncos are 0 3. Next game, Chicago Bears. The game after that, the New York Super Jets. Bowl. So when you're watching Sean Payton in this team, you get maybe the worst team in the NFL with Chicago Bears next. And then after that, you have to watch him face Zach Wilson. Um, and then in the next two or three games, it's Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs twice uh and for the dolphins real quick they do have the buffalo bills followed by the new york giants the carolina panthers again we talked about last year when if you bodied or tried to these wide receivers made to a make difficult throws then you had a chance right and that went along towards the end of the season with obviously the awful head injuries that he was having to deal with we're seeing 
not just the counter punches from Mike McDaniel, but we're seeing the counter punches from Tua as well. Like in week one, or was it week two? He was making tons of off platform throws out of structure against pressure. And now we're incorporating all these running backs. And Hayden, we do talk about size a lot when it comes to running backs. Yeah. And we have seen it come into fruition where these backs do not score touchdowns in other teams. I think James Cook and Buffalo is like a great example of that. They just would rather give it to Damian Harris and Latavius Murray. But when no one on the Miami Dolphins like really has size and their critical factors are speed, then I think we should acknowledge and maybe use it in the frame of mind that the team is looking at these players when they're mm -hmm. all kind of a similar size. And in that case, they can all work, you know, and yeah. I think even when Jeff Wilson comes back, if he is healthy, he can work in this backfield, too. Yeah, I think I think Jeff Wilson will have some type of role here. Yeah. So they, they change stuff. It's just you're utilizing him ways like it's not just talk like they're actually scheming him up. Like it's never under center running it up the middle with him, which is totally fine. Um, and like we said, like they did this without Jalen Waddle, like one of the best players in the league without Jalen Waddle, 70 points without Waddle. Yeah. All right. We'll keep it going. Next up, an 18 point comeback in the fourth quarter. Saints versus Packers. Yes. 17, nothing with, about eight minutes to go, 10 minutes to go in the third quarter. Derek Carr and company have done a fantastic job through two and a half quarters uh, with a touchdown to Jimmy Graham, a Rashid Shaheed punt return score. But again, with 10 minutes to go, Rashawn Gary works around Ryan Ramchek, sacks Derek Carr, slams him, pulls him to the surface. Derek Carr leaves with a right shoulder injury that Nick Underhill believes will force him to miss extended action. And then five minutes left to go in the third quarter is where things really start going because Jordan Love starts, honestly, making a bit of music. Uh, Romeo Dobbs, fingertip grab along the sideline. That drive, though, ends with a fourth and two that they failed to convert, which they also failed to convert a previous fourth down. Next drive, Jordan Love starts hitting intermediate passes. Jane Reed nearly comes down with a touchdown, hits his butt on the floor, ball comes out. That drive in ends in a field goal. And during this time, we're getting, with the Saints, the... Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill experiment. And while they're picking up like smaller gains, it doesn't look nearly as cohesive as what a Derek Carr led offense would look like. Um, and then we're about to get two touchdowns here for, for the Packers deep shot penalties, eight minutes to go. Jordan Love is facing a third and 10 hits Jaden Reed middle of the field for a first down fourth and goal read option. He takes it in. And this is really the moment where the Packers won the game. When Matt LaFleur listened to the analytics, the offseason discussion, and realizes when you're down by 14 and then the score goes from 17 to 9 after scoring your touchdown, you could easily kick the extra point, be down by 7. But instead, Matt LaFleur, like all the nerds want him to do, goes for 2 with the idea that if you get the extra point on the next touchdown, you win it. And if you miss the two-point conversion, you still can get a two-pointer on the next touchdown to then tie it up. So... They get it. Jordan Love runs it in after. He, oh, excuse me. He, he throws it for the two point conversion. And then later on, after a huge outstretched Jaden Reed catch for 25 yards, third and three back shorter dime to Romeo Dobbs for a touchdown. Saints new kicker has a chance to win in the end. He misses a 46 yarder. And that's a wrap. Again, 18 point comeback for Jordan Love and this Packers team that are now two and one. How one dimensional was it? Because I'm looking at AJ Dillon, 11 carries for 33 yards. It sounded like it was just Jordan Love making some good plays down the end. And like, could we spin forward and look at like Christian Watson, and Aaron Jones? Like, they need like some speed back in their lineup. Well, it's a bunch of young guys still on the Packers offense. And there were a bunch of just narrowly missed plays. Like Luke Musgrave, they saw a too high shell. Luke Musgrave ran down the seam would have been maybe for like a 60 plus yard touchdown and Jordan Love just air mails him on it just put the safeties and that's you know the second time in three weeks that we're saying that mm -hmm. Luke Musgrave can score a long touchdown uh Jaden Reed had two other near touchdowns that he just missed one was near the goal line great hit dislodges it the other one was when his butt hits and then the corner rips it out as well and then I don't know what it is with Romeo Dobbs man but I thought of him as like this burner coming out of college. And now he's just like really playing big, the big receiver game and just bullying guys in contest situations, but really it comes back to Jordan love. Like it's so funny when you see backup quarterbacks play in the preseason and they almost imitate the mannerisms of the starting quarterback 
We're seeing that a little bit with Jordan Love when things break down, when he buys a bit of time, the flicks that he throws off platform. It has like that Aaron Rodgers aesthetic to it just a little bit. And I thought he stepped up massively in this game. Again, it helps that the Saints, yes, they're two and one, but their offense are major question marks now without Derek Carr for an extended period of time. But they maximize it. And, you know, the defense stood tall when they needed to as well. I would imagine, although you want everyone out there for every game, that they rested those three big players, Christian Watson, Aaron Jones, yeah. and David Bakhtiari, because big divisional game against the Lions on Thursday night. And and now we've seen, as we talked about last week, A.J. Dillon, 26 carries for 92 yards the past two games, just not cutting it. No, and there were moments when Patrick Taylor actually, I felt, looked better yeah. than A.J. Dillon. Um, I will go to the Saints very quickly. Chris Olave had an outstanding one-handed catch along the sideline. He ends with 11 targets, eight receptions, 104 yards. Tony Jones did start this game. He did get eight carries for 31 yards. He was also trusted in the passing game most of the time. Got four targets for 21 yards there. But Kendra Miller was mixing in. He was mixing in. And he got nine carries for 34. Had a really tough like five or six-yard gain that converted on a third down as well. Um, he only saw one target despite being used in the passing game in the preseason. So it, it wasn't like, you know, the 15 touch outcome that we were hoping to see from Kendra Miller, but also, um, the offensive line just had major questions. They lost Cesar Ruiz, like halfway through, they were missing some other starters along it too. And, uh, it was almost everything started hitting for the Packers and especially their defense. And they really suffocated the, the saints offense, uh, in the third and fourth quarters for sure. Do you think it'll just be all Alvin Kamara starting next week? I think it kind of has to be. I mean, again, it's not going to be all. It's not going to be an 80% backfield. Mm -hmm. Now, who can I tell you who it's going to be between Tony Jones and Kendra Miller? No, I, I, I can't tell you if it's going to be like a, a one and a two. They might mix in here and there, but for missing an extended period of time, I thought Kendra looked fine, but Tony Jones also looked fine. Um, neither one kind of stood out. And I just wish they got Rashid Shahid going more offensively because, look, he got one carry in this game. He only got two targets. And his one real touch was a long punt return touchdown that was the pathway for this team having one of their two offensive, or excuse me, total touchdowns. And he's more than like a splash player, you know? He's a, he's a role player who every time he touches it can change the outcome of a game. And to me, if you're manufacturing stuff for let's say Taysom Hill, you should be able to manufacture things for Rashid Shahid at the same time because just their explosiveness and their burst is like totally different. It's crazy what Michael Thomas is doing nine targets again, uh, but nine yards after the catch. Like he's yeah. like, it's the same thing over and over again. It's all physicality for them. Um, and I, I don't expect that to change all that much. I, I think he'll probably rack up a hundred plus targets this year, like fairly easily. Yeah. It, it, it's all just like uh, alley-oops, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Just like sit him at the, near the hoop and throw it up to him and allow him to win uh, contested. All right. Another big upset of the day. Indianapolis Colts, yes. Even without Anthony Richardson, improve to two and one. Colts versus Ravens. 22 to 19. The Colts beat the Ravens. I believe this one went to overtime after a few possessions, Daigle. Not Adam Vinatieri steps up to the plate and kicks a field goal to win it for the Gardner Minshew-led Colts. And another game for the Ravens where it was just mistakes in the box score, even trying to get their backfield going. At one point in the second quarter, Kenyon Drake had a 24-yard gain. He seems to be the one that had the most juice today. Gus Edwards lost in the middle of a game with a concussion too, but then on his next touch following that splash play, he did fumble the ball, and that allowed Gardner Minshew to go 6-of-6 six six on the next drive for – a 23-yard pass to Alec Pierce, and then cap it with a 17-yard touchdown catch to Zach Moss. Moss, of course, who yet again saw 30-plus touches in this game. Unbelievable. And on the very next drive, speaking of lost opportunities, Lamar Jackson fumbled back to the Colts inside their own 20. But let's fast forward a little bit closer to the end of the game. Ravens' penalty stops the clock. A high punt only goes 34 yards and gives the Colts the ball back down by three at their own 38. So they have 141 to get Matt Gay in field goal position, and they eventually get there and kick it to send it into overtime. 
Both teams go three and out in overtime. And the Colts do get a splash play on their second possession. A massive 37-yard catch to Michael Pittman in between two defenders. Contested catch. He brings it down. Arguably the best catch of his career. Having said that, they still get stuffed. So the Ravens are going to get it back to try and finish this game. And eventually, like the Chargers, they reach fourth and three from the 50-yard line. Harbaugh calls a timeout because obviously this team is now going for it. And like a lot of examples today, including Amari Cooper having a touchdown call back, which we'll talk to when we get about when we get to that game, but Zay Flowers on fourth and three, running a crossing route over the middle, gets hooked and dragged like a wrestling move to the ground, but no call, and the Colts get the ball back. Very next play, Zach Moss has a splash run for 10-plus yards, and Matt Gay then kicks his fourth 50-plus yard field goal to defeat the Ravens, as you mentioned, 22-19. It seems like I'm looking at this. I mean, Bateman, one catch on three targets, no Odell Beckham. You have no downfield options right yeah. here. Zay, Zay's getting enough targets to, to make it work, eight catches, all of it underneath. Like, Mark Andrews is not going to go – down the field, you're they're they're missing that number one down the field guy, and Bateman has not stepped up to the plate at all in either of the three games. Dig, I wanted to ask because I was just watching this out of the corner of my eye. Was weather affecting this? Was it sloppy? Because this say flowers like manufactured stuff that you can't run further than five yards down the field. Like we're getting that too much right now, and I it's know consistent. we're only three, yeah we're only three weeks into this, but we have seen him win vertical at times. Things need to happen in the middle of the field, the intermediate area, other than Mark Andrews for this team to like really take the next step and not have like these chaotic games when you only put up 19 points and lose to the Indianapolis Colts without their starting quarterback. You know what I mean? Like things need to be expanded from a guy like this. Slight wind, but genuinely no weather that everyone was concerned about coming into the week. Also, Rashad Bateman did finally reach a route on over 60% of his drop back, 76%. But you ask, where are they getting juice from? Bateman said after the game, because he was absent for a lot of overtime, that he once again strained his hamstring. So oh, no. we may be having to deal with that issue with Odell Beckham also out this game dealing with an ankle injury. So we'll see what happens beyond this. But right now, it's two people. It's only Zay Flowers for those purposeful routes and Mark Andrews. And then I'm looking at Lamar Jackson, obviously ridiculous on the ground. I think, I believe he's the quarterback one going into Sunday night football. He had six runs over 10 yards uh, on the ground. He had a couple of ridiculous uh, yeah. plays from the corner out of my eye to get into the end zone. So like it's Lamar Jackson still going to get there and for fantasy purposes, but like to be like a real, real, real team, you need to be what happened last week when you have at least a post route, a play action post route or something like that down the field. They just didn't have that today. It reminds me of last week when we saw the game, the box store didn't, re didn't reflect how Lamar Jackson played. He had total command of that game last week, but the results weren't there. I feel like it's the same, except we at least got the rushing yards in this one. Mm -hmm. On the other, uh, quickly with this backfield, it was just Gus Edwards. Mostly. I mean, 11 carries 51. I saw that Melvin Gordon popped in there. Is that like a 1A, 1B? Is that something that we should pay attention to moving forward? How, how would you discern between the two? Melvin Gordon really started playing only when Gus suffered his concussion. So they are just down to two players right now. Justice Hill's injury is not expected to be serious. He may even be back next week. Just something we'll have to monitor. And, and concussions now are kind of handled differently over the last, let's say, year or two versus how they used to. Like it's, it's becoming extremely more difficult for players to return after. Basically guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're basically guaranteed to, to miss the, the next game. Okay. Speaking of running backs, 30 carries again for Zach Moss. Like, sure, Trey Sermon pops in there for five just for, you know, Shane Steichen to be like, hey, Hayden, here you go. A quick word for Shane Steichen. Um, so many excuses across the league. This guy doesn't have Jonathan Taylor. This guy also doesn't have Anthony Richardson. And he goes out there, and even his quarterback takes five sacks for 39 yards, goes 27 of 44, and yet they still win the daggum football game. Shane Sykin can coach. And we're seeing their target tree somewhat become whittled down to Michael Pittman and Josh Downs. Josh Downs leads the team today with a 25.5% target share, but also in his first two games, he didn't dip below a 17% target share in either. So he's consistently been there for those typical shallow slot routes and just yet again commanded targets. Gardner Minshew was sloppy in the first half too, but did respond in the second half and just kept the team floating along. 
We only I mean, have one more game without Jonathan Taylor. They played the Rams next week we at think. home. We they think three and we one. Think. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. I was like Zach Moss. Like next week, I'll be ranking him really high. Bets off this usage. Will it last longer than that? Uh, I think I saw him on the sideline on the broadcast oh. angle. Um, but they were playing at home here, right? Yeah, and it's a situation like Kyron Williams where you don't even think about like who the player actually is when you're getting thirty touches. Who cares? Just throw him out there. You're a, you're a RB five. Uh, Indianapolis Colts have the Los Angeles Rams and Tennessee Titans over the next two weeks. Meanwhile, for the Baltimore Ravens, Cleveland Browns, Pittsburgh Steelers, three AFC North teams battling it out over the next two games. Texans versus Jaguars. Oh, yes. We keep the theme going with massive upsets as Hayden's guy, C.J. Stroud, goes 20 of 30, 280 yards and two scores as the Texans beat the Jaguars 37 to 17 with both te- teams with one win under their belt compared to two losses. CJ Stroud just looks completely composed here. Despite all those offensive line injuries, he was sacked zero times. And that has to be really wow. frustrating for Jacksonville. They just spent the first overall pick on an edge rusher and they can't get anything out of him that's really disappointing on the Jacksonville end. Tank Dell, he has the long touchdown here, 68 yarder, got him in like a trip set, a coverage bust down the field, wide open. CD Stroud puts it on the money. Uh, Tank Dell is a full time player right now with Noah Brown out of there. Uh, Nico Collins uh, didn't have to get going in this game, only three targets. I'm not really concerned about him long term. Uh, Robert Woods is still in his full time role. Luckily for us, Josh, we do get a Damian Pierce. Uh, touchdown in the yeah, red zone here. Um, it's not going to be very efficient until that offensive line truly comes back. But like what we said, uh, just watching CJ Stroud the first couple weeks, like of the rookie quarterbacks, he is by far the one that's most comfortable as a passer. It's functional in garbage time. It was functional with a lead here as well. CJ Stroud's accuracy and composure in an offense right now that's lacking uh, juice and offensive line talent is pretty uh, impressive to me. And I think that the they're getting some nice schemed up stuff as well here. So super impressive win for uh, Houston. Tank Dell, 145 receiving yards today, which is the most by a Texans rookie in franchise history. And remember, that's an organization that had peak Andre Johnson and DeAndre Hopkins. Wow. Yeah. Uh, on the other side, I think I either talked about in this show or stats versus film where after week two, You saw Trevor Lawrence in the bottom five when talking about EPA and completion percentage over expected. And I was like, well, that's going to change against the Houston Texans. He's not playing that poorly. Mm -hmm. It kind of seems like the Jaguars offense is playing that poorly at this point. I mean, he has, you know, three touchdowns through three games in the air. Um, 279, 216, 241. Passing yards, six sacks. Didn't take any today, but six sacks through the first two weeks of the season as well. What gives? What can improve on this team? To make it worse, the Texans, as a reminder, were missing their cornerback one, Derek Stingley, their cornerback two, their starting safety, and a starting linebacker here. I thought Trevor Lawrence actually played pretty well in this game. He forced an interception that he should not have had. But we had Swagnu fumbles the ball. They had at least four drops. Calvin Ridley dropped the ball again. He probably would have had a couple touchdowns like it was last week. Like wow. To me, it's the skill players, and which is shocking because they have a good variety of them. Uh, early on in the game, uh, to third and two, they're doing a zone read, and Travis Etienne falls on that. Uh, Etienne played 30 of the 33 snaps early on, but in comes Tank Bigsby with the goal line touchdown. Tank Bigsby basically doesn't play, and then he gets the goal line opportunity, so we're losing that with Travis Etienne. Christian Kirk, he's a two-wide receiver set starter. Um, he was used primarily downfield in this game, but I think that Trevor Lawrence looks fine. Last week, to me, was an offensive line issue. This week, it was just... Evan Ingram underneath, that's not that only has so much expectations. But Calvin Ridley, like he dropped the ball a couple times in this game. You had some uh, untimely uh, penalties. You had some third and twos that didn't go your way. Uh, so Trevor Lawrence, like, like look at this right here. Like oh, he did uh, complete more passes over expectation than you would expect. But they just couldn't move the ball consistently at all, and that's sh- really surprising because the Texans were missing like legitimately four or five of their best defensive players. There was a point in the first half, too, where Doug Peterson punted on fourth and one from the Texans Mm. 40. It's like, what are we doing here? Mm. I will say the other thing, Calvin Ridley, um, like towards the middle of the game, got hit in his knee. Might be like a little like a mild MCL sprain. He was able to play through it, but you have to kind of wonder, like, 
how much that was affecting them. Zay Jones was not out there. Tim Jones is not going to be getting the respect. So they just didn't get anything out of the skill group last week. They didn't get anything out of the skill group or the offensive line. I didn't think it was really an offensive line issue as much this week as it was before, but I'm looking at it just right now. Uh, for example, PFF gives Trevor Lawrence an 88.4 grade, which is like really high. That would be like probably close to top five on the week, but everyone else was just a negative on this team. I was counting my chickens with Calvin Ridley after that massive week one. And then the last two weeks, Christian Kirk is the one who gets home. So it's, it kind of shows you, I don't know, it, it, it is on my radar. And I don't know if it changed this week. Maybe you can tell me, Hayden, that Doug Pearson was an awesome play caller last year. And then he just gave it up this offseason. And now it's been Press Taylor. Like, I think there's going to be some local Duval pressure for Doug Pearson to take mm -hmm. this play calling back because while what you're saying, and I actually thought it was true through the first two weeks that it's not totally on Trevor, just something isn't clicking in this way. And they should be a more talented team than they were last season. Yeah, they're one and two right now. It's, it's time to get going. Uh, quickly on the Texans, we mentioned with Damian Pierce that, like, hey, when they start winning, or like be competitive, then hey, good things can happen. And sure, we got a touchdown here and three receptions for 28 yards. Is it now more of a hey, once the offensive line gets healthy, that's when we can bank on Damian Pierce? Because now we have both environments and he's still less than 50 rushing yards. Yeah, the the underlying metric that's still is scaring me with Damian, he ran around on 12 of the 31 dropbacks. So that that's how you have to you have to improve on that to like truly have upside. Um, but I do think C.J. Stroud's carrying this offense. And when you have Larry Tunsil back, who's probably going to be back next week, and maybe you get some of these interior guys back, Titus Howard as well, I think there's a chance that Damian could be at least somewhat efficient on the ground and have all the goal line opportunities. Not worry about the goal line stuff. It's just the pass game we haven't seen despite the preseason usage. Falcons versus Lions. Lions win this one 20 to six improved to two and one as the Falcons drop also to two and one. This game was defined by the Lions defense looking outstanding. They were roughing up the Falcons in pass pro Desmond Ritter was either being pressured or having clean pockets and being super erratic. And on the opposite end of that, Jared Goff in the first half was making a bunch of big time throws in the face of pressure. Uh, Quickly, 18 receptions for Sam Laporta through his first three games. That's the most for a rookie tight end since the start of the 20, 2006 season in the first three weeks of an NFL year. Um, they hit him on this awesome vertical leak route. Obviously, they were running a bunch of flood. And as soon as you know the safety bites down on this, then boom, Sam Laporta hits them the opposite way. But just even at halftime, I think is like a perfect – dissection of what these offenses are. Sam Laporte had 70 yards. Amon Ross St. Brown at 63. Um, Khalif Raymond had 55. Meanwhile, on the opposite end, Drake London was one for 28. Kyle Pitts was two for 26. Bijan only had eight carries for 40 yards, three touches for Tyler Algier. And it just kind of kept snowballing from there because the Lions had four sacks at halftime, had a few more in the second half. And then it goes down to Arthur Smith's coaching because – there was a third and six on the opponent's 30-yard line. Arthur Smith calls a simple off-left tackle handoff to B. John Robinson. He's totally stuffed, showing zero trust in his quarterback, zero trust in his offensive line and pass pro, and the field goal is missed subsequently after that. And then a bit later on, when the scoreboard is very similar, a touchdown changes things. They go for it on fourth and five, and one of the, not say few clean pockets for the day, but perfect throwing windows, and Desmond Ritter is just totally off. Totally off on his throw. So it's a chicken or the egg thing, I think, a lot for the Atlanta Falcons, where is it the play calling or is it this play calling that they're working around their quarterback and not with him because of how bad the quarterback is? Because if a team like the defense that the Lions showed up today stuffs the running backs with B. John Robinson just going 10 carries for 33 yards and Tyler Algier for 7 for 12, there is no jump start that the Falcons offense has right now. The Lions were super banged up on defense going into this game, too. So, like, the fact... And the Lions haven't been getting much pressure uh, either. So, like, the fact he took seven sacks, like... Do you think that was an offensive line issue? Is it a Ritter issue? Because, like, he... he To me, he holds, he holds on the ball way too yeah. long and then checks down too much. And I think that's probably leading into some sacks, too. Uh, there was a bunch of individual efforts that were winning. 
and the Lions have this new wrinkle on like clear third down pass rushing situations that Aiden Hutchinson will line up now on the interior and he's just wreaking havoc in that and I think now his go-to celebration is a stanky leg which cool I was doing that back in college at Elon as a SIG app so like just don't steal that from me Hutch um, but yeah I mean it, 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 it does fall down to Desmond Ritter like there's just nothing that we have seen through three games that indicates that he should be anything like he sh- that he should finish out the season. To be honest with you, I know it's they're two and one, but I would say that's despite Desmond Ritter so far, and not because mm-hmm. of him. It just felt like he was so late on everything today. Even when he was getting these passes to his pass catchers, as soon as they were touching the football, it was Brian Branch, whoever else, just planting them in the air and planting them hospital balls all over the place. And I I couldn't see from the TV angle, but I'm just guessing it's because that he was late on almost every single throw. It is happening behind the scenes for Bijan Robinson too, although it doesn't seem like it in the box score and the results today, because Bijan has now run a route on at least 75% of the team's dropbacks in all three games. So that pass catching role is not going away. And also his share of the team's running back carries have increased in every game, up to 58% today after 54% last week. So it's just growing slowly every single game. But you know what's, you know, I, I'm sure the Falcons like try to take a step back and like survey the landscape, right? Mm-hmm. And while the Saints are two and one, they might not have their quarterback for an extended period of time. We'll see what happens with Baker Mayfield and the Bucks playing against the Philadelphia Eagles and, and what they show. But even despite all this discourse that we're saying about their offense and Desmond Ritter, Arthur Smith might say, hey, if I win nine games this year, I can make the playoffs and and that is good enough. So why would I even try to change this? Why would I even go to Taylor Heineke if he's like, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to put myself in potentially his shoes, dangerous place. But while I think Falcons fans after watching this game will, will get upset, I don't know if they're going to be willing to change it for that very reason. Like it's not going to take a lot for them to win in the NFC South this year. Yeah. Scary stuff. A couple more things. Kyle Pitts had a deep post early on and it looked very J.K. Dobbins-esque in terms of not being able to stride out. I think his athleticism has been sapped right now during this early part of the season. Um, and then quickly, I want to talk about Jameer Gibbs, who gets 17 carries for 80 yards. Um, Zonovan Knight got a carry before Craig Reynolds. We really didn't see Craig Reynolds until like the end of the first half and then the end of the second half. They were trying to get Jameer Gibbs going on inside carries and inside the 10-yard line, but... In almost every one of those situations, he was getting stuffed. Um, first contact would just drive him to the ground. Now, there was one drive where he had 36 rushing yards, like a 12-yard gain, then a 24-yard gain, and those were important. He was slivering through the interior of the defense. But other than that, they people might get mad. They were severely missing Dave Montgomery, and they tried to hand it off to their fullback on fourth and one, and that didn't work out. So um, it, this wasn't a... Jameer Gibbs takes this the rest of the way and runs with it type of performance for me, even though he obviously did get, you know, 82 total yards on 18 touches. You I do. Believe, he didn't play that many pass downs uh, this game either, despite David Montgomery not playing. He, according to PFF right now, he had only two reps in pass protection and had a 25.5 grade on them. So that's still something that's lacking on his yep. profile. Um, and we'll see about David Montgomery uh, going into next week. You still yeah. take the usage, though. I had oh, yeah. more questions about his early down role and Craig Reynolds or Zonovan Knight stepping up in that department, but 71% of the team's running back carries to go along with only two, I know, but 100% of their running back targets. I'll take that every week because we only and think it's going to grow. Khalif Raymond uh, really outplayed Josh Reynolds, who got a goose egg. I don't think Josh Reynolds was moving like normal. Um, it was just off like these deep play actions, which, again, I think speaks to maybe some of those pass pro uh, opportunities and Khalif Raymond was just like getting on the cornerbacks toes and breaking off of them. And and he was wide open. And once again, Ben Johnson just has these awesome play calls like third and three, let's get Amon Ross St. Brown in the backfield and then put him one-on-one against Troy Anderson, a second year linebacker. And he has, he has no chance. You know, mm-hmm. we talked about leak earlier. Just Ben Johnson is one of the best throughout the NFL. Josh, before we leave here, Sam Laporta. I mean, are we, are we getting close to top five? Fantasy yeah. tight end. I mean, that's 11 targets. He's moving well out there, scores a touchdown this time. Like, I think Reynolds will have some spike weeks as we've seen, but I think like a consistent number two pass catcher so far has been Laporta. 
Well, I, th- I think if the Falcons were going to try to keep it even more competitive, he would have had a bigger game. He had four catches, I think, in the first quarter. Again, wow. no rookie tight end has had this many receptions in the first three weeks of the season uh, since the start of the tw- 2006 season. Titans versus Browns. Eagle, the Browns win this one big. 27 to 3. How'd it look? Everyone wants to know about Sean Watson, but let's start with the true winners of this game, and that was the Browns' defense. Tennessee finished with 96 yards on offense, their fewest since they relocated from Houston in 1997. They recorded more punts than first downs across their nine possessions and got sacked five times. That was why the Browns won. At the same time, it was a game where Watson was needed to command the offense, and he did so. 82% completion rate, the second highest mark of his career, 19 of 21 for 214 yards to wide receivers per next-gen stats, and also a 40-yard touchdown to Amari Cooper, which was the most air yards of any completion since he joined Cleveland. Not to mention Amari Cooper's negated 40-yard touchdown because the ref blew the whistle and said he stepped Mm. out of bounds when he was legitimately a full two yards from being out of bounds. One of the wildest calls of the afternoon. But Watson still had, although it looks well, the numbers, there were still some processing that was lacking. There's even at one point in time where he's getting sacked and he goes full Carson Wentz and throws the ball to Jerome Ford seven yards behind the line of scrimmage as he's falling down backwards. Yeah, it just makes no sense at all. So still a few errors here and there on that. But nonetheless, it's what you expected and hoped Watson to do against this piss poor Titan secondary. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers. Uh, he, he, time to throw for Deshaun was over three seconds, which is like one of the highest in the league. The difference this year versus last year, though, he's still holding on to the ball, and I'm sure that's what's leading to some of these wonky plays, like you mentioned. But this year, he's throwing the ball downfield. dot was over nine yards again. Last year, he was holding on the ball and not throwing the ball downfield. So it's going to be inconsistent and stuff, but at least if he's going to be throwing the ball downfield, we can start getting <laughs> some spiked weeks from these guys. And, you know, Dago, I think one of the easiest, if this happens, then this happens, is if Deshaun Watson has a good performance, then it goes through Amari Cooper. Um, because, really, he is the most consistent member of this offense. Now, I do want to add that Elijah Moore was schemed a ton of touches in this game. I mean, he had nine catches for 49 yards. Um, he also had three carries that ended with negative one yard. So, maybe that is a bit of like, hey, Kevin Stefanski, I can show off my play calling if I want a quick hitter and not like a three plus second play that Sean Watson's going to be out there. But man, Amari, eight targets, seven receptions, 116 yards and a score. We're going to have some up and down games because that's still like you outlined, Daigle, the Deshaun Watson experience at the moment. But again, if we run into great matchups like we did against the Titans, Amari's going to have a great day. Well, it's becoming concerted in Cleveland, the target tree from Watson. Amari has... 28.8% of Watson's targets. Elijah Moore is next on the team with 25.2%. And the next closest after that is Njoku with only 11%. It's a two-man show in Cleveland, which makes it really easy to dwindle down that target tree weekly. You mentioned Elijah Moore getting concerted touches. He also has six carries through three games. Like They just consistently keep on trying to feature him in every way possible despite being their slot receiver. So those are the two guys that matter in Cleveland. Well... First game without Nick Chubb, Jerome mm-hmm. Ford, while the yardage might be low, let's put it at 51 combined yards on 12 touches. Two scores. Two scores, but if we only look at first half splits, given it was a blowout in the second half, still only three of the team's six running back carries because, again, they were leaning on Watson more so than on the ground. Also, the Titans. Against the, of course, against the Titans. And Ford still finishes with only 48% of the team's backfield touches. The guiding light here, though, is that he did run 25 routes to Kareem Hunt's and Pierre Strong's combined seven. So they basically were not involved in that department, hence why Jerome Ford also scored uh, a touchdown, receiving touchdown in the red zone, which was a double move when you go back and watch it. It wasn't just a uh, come out the flats. They actually assigned a route to him. So that seems to be also where he's featured without Nick Chubb. Yeah, Ravens and the 49ers coming up both games at home for the Cleveland Browns next. So those are two fun tests for them. Quickly on the Titans, Daigle. I mean, Ryan Tano only throws for 104 yards on 13 completions. They only get 26 yards on the ground. DeAndre Hopkins gets seven targets, but can only muster 48 yards on top of that. I mean, with how this, I mean, what, five sacks Ryan Tano takes? Peter Skaronsky, we know, missed this game. 
it's just an offense that can't function in an environment like this? Pretty much. We're hoping for DeAndre Hopkins to keep on getting these 24% target share games, a lot like Marquise Brown. And that, But does that he, matter? Like 24% on the Titans? Like, I, you know, to me, that's just different than like a team that actually is functional offensively. You know what I mean? I, I agree with you. That's why I compare him to Marquise Brown, where you're in a situation like today in, in a in a home league, because we're all just ravished with injuries and lineups. Yeah. I had a choice between Marquise Brown and Sky Moore. And I said, well, one of them's going to get targets and one of them's not going to. So I'll take the uglier offense. And sometimes it's that simple. I think maybe sometimes people are in that situation with Hopkins. So that's when you play him. It's not like you want to play him. Yeah. Already, maybe the worst offensive line in the league, missing Peter Skaronsky. That's how you go total stone cold disaster. Looking at yards before contact, Titans negative 15. Oh my gosh. Oh, okay. And I know it's a blowout game script, but still, Taji Spears is just beating on the door. Um, out snapped Derrick Henry in the first half, now has 18 touches in the past two games. Derrick Henry has been under 18 touches in two of three games, whereas, like, that was. The reason we had him last year because we he averaged twenty eight per game. Now we're chopping ten plus off that because Taji Spears is the clear pass catching back who also looks explosive in the running game. So people have a Derrick Henry problem, myself included. Bills versus Commanders. The Washington Commanders were two and two and zero. The Buffalo Bills were one on one, and the Bills steamroll them thirty seven to three. Uh, we can outline the Bills offense if you want to, Hayden, but I'm laughing. I'm laughing because I'm looking at the Sam Howell stat line of four interceptions Buddy. and nine and nine sacks taken. Yep. Buddy, this was this is how you start getting on the bench radar here. The Sam Howell or interceptions were on a couple different ways. He had a third and 19 one, which I don't really care about that too much. He had a blind throw under pressure. That was a touchdown. He had a red zone touchdown um, un under pressure, but the pick six on this tip, he was kind of rolling out, trying to throw it over and just gets caught right in front of him, rolls out there. He was under pressure the entire game. Um, and what we learned for fantasy purposes, because Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson and, and, the, and the tight ends and stuff, it just, they're spreading the ball out. Sam Howell has been too inconsistent. It's basically all shot plays. But Brian Robinson, once we get this thing into negative game script, this is how things go bad for you. Yeah. Only seven routes the entire game. So obviously when you have the negative game script, we now have that answered. Brian Robinson's going to be erased here. But this was a Sam Howell game where you're looking at it and you're like, okay, defensive, the defense is playing okay, okay, okay. Defensive head coach, you can't afford interceptions. So he's. they already said that they're going to go to Sam Howell for next week. They are two and one. But the interceptions were, were were brutal, and the pressure was also brutal. But at least, you know, he completed 8% more of over expectation for his Does that uh, include percentage. when the other team catches it? Did that That's wild. Yeah. yeah, as you said, Brian Robinson, 10 carries for 70 yards. We get another Antonio Gibson fumble. Another Antonio Gibson fumble. Yeah, it back was. Back weeks. The, the broadcast said like the, the commanders have two good running backs. I was like, two good running backs? What are you talking about here? Yeah, it was, it was a miserable game. Okay, talk about the Bills then, because like we again, a 70 burger is different than a 37 pointer. But I'm looking at the stat line, and it's not like anyone totally jumps out the page other than Stefan Diggs, eight receptions, 111 yards. But like Josh Allen gets a rushing touchdown, Latavius Murray gets a rushing touchdown, Gabe Davis gets a receiving touchdown. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a, it's a communal effort here. Yeah, we got three field goals here, so that's how you get some points. We had that pick six that I talked about from AJ Epinesa. Uh, Seth Diggs just did whatever you want. A lot of it's underneath, intermediate. He was winning in isolation, doing his own thing. Gabe Davis, classic Gabe Davis performance, wins on a corner route down there. The play of the game to me was the Josh Allen scramble touchdown. He's, I would say 90% NFL quarterbacks probably go down with a sack there. He shrugs it off, runs into the end zone, and then – uh, James Cook, same old, same old. He's the early down guy, explosive. And then Latavius Murray, he's the one that mixes in for the goal line touchdown here. So um, I think the Bills offense is really good. We're going to have the uh, just crazy Josh Allen games every once in a while. But at the end of the season, we'll refresh and this will team will be top three or four in EPA per play. Yeah, he had one of those plays where pedal to the floor, run around, throw it off his back foot or like falling away. And it was just a perfect dime to Stefan Diggs. Mm -hmm. So like yeah. you have to take those negative plays with the good ones too. Mm -hmm. And 
it's just the roller coaster that you're on and it, and it totally works. It totally works when it does. I will add Don Kincaid had the fewest receiving yards in this game. And is it getting to a point that if Dawson Knox plays, like you can't play Dalton Kincaid at the same time? So with Kincaid, he was out there for 35 to 68 snaps, 26 of 38 routes. That's kind of like in that 60 to 70% range, which traditionally does not mean tight end one performances. I think Kincaid's going to be just touchdown or bust like the other guys. I would just wish we would have seen more of the seam stretching stuff and less of the like air. He doesn't have basically any air yards this year. Right. Because it, you know, it was only 16 nothing heading into the fourth quarter. Like that's when the Bills exploded was a 21 point fourth quarter. So it's not like it was 37 nothing at halftime and then like everything just got out of whack. It was still 16 nothing through three quarters. So like some of the usage should be what we expect of it in that time. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say here? Because like while it looks like a blow on the scoreboard, we should have probably gotten more from the likes of Dalton Kincaid here now. Yeah, I mean, Kincaid, his yards per out run was 0.12. So, I mean, like, it's you're getting nothing out of him so far. On the other side, I think everyone is still asking, too, what do we do with Jahan Dotson and Terry McLaurin? A big McLaurin? week is coming. A big and, week is coming. <laughs> and I, I know we need better quarterback play to start with, but honestly, it's just the target tree, how spread out it is. No one can get there. You have Terry McLaurin, 16% of the team's targets. Jahan Dotson, 16%. Curtis Samuel, 12%. And none of them are soaking up even 23% of the air yard. So they're not they're splitting targets and they're not getting downfield. That's not a good recipe for fantasy football. Yeah, my fear is that's a somehow a B enemy thing, just going back to how Kansas City's box scores have, have been. And like a lot of like the target shared numbers are like going to the tight end. Like it's not help, helping us. We're not starting Cole Turner or Logan Thomas or any of those guys, but like every single week you refresh and those guys have seven or eight targets. Bears versus Chiefs. Oof. Chiefs improved to two and one, demolishing the Chicago Bears who are 0 and 3, 41 to 10. And it was 34 to nothing at halftime. And to be honest, I wasn't even able to watch the second half because YouTube TV like decides to not show it anymore. They were doing <laughs> us a favor. We should thank yeah. YouTube TV. Thank they, you, YouTube. It says, hey, you can watch any game you want to. And then they just pull it from the lineup and start showing the Cowboys and the Cardinals instead, sure. which totally fine. Um, I guess we can start with the Chiefs. All, all three of their running backs scored touchdowns in the first half, including... Uh, Jarek McKinnon on two, three catches, getting two scores. It was hilarious to me, Hayden, that we had someone the Sunday morning Q&A show be like, I'm sorry, Jarek McKinnon and in three lineups, he's locked in. And then he goes out there and scores the first two touchdowns of the game, mm -hmm. basically. Um, Isaiah Pacheco does pop up for 15 carries, 62 yards and a score. CEH got the first goal line work, 15 carries, 55 yards and a score from him. Um, Patrick Holmes and Travis Kelsey were the mind meld stuff that we've typically seen with Kelsey getting eight targets, seven receptions, 69 yards and a score. So he's back to saving the tight end position. Also on my radar is just the obsession that NFL insiders have with Taylor Swift. I mean, three straight tweets from Adam Schefter being like T Swift is at this game sitting next to Donna Kelsey. I'm like, cool. I don't know. I'm just not into it. T Swift um, or clicks obsessed with both of them. I, I, I guess so. Rap sheet was asking for a solo cam to be on Taylor Swift for the entire time and that he's willing to pay for it. I don't know, guys. Okay. Creepy. Um, to be Adam, honest, you I have probably, kids, by the way, Adam. Let's lay off of that. Like, we, I, we get it. I, I, I would have preferred to watch that, though, instead of watching Justin Fields play football. At the end of the day, 11 of 22, 99 yards in the air. And that includes a garbage time 29 yarder to DJ Moore. Granted, DJ Moore did drop a teardrop along the sideline earlier. Um, he just can't play quarterback right now. Just can't do it. Can't see it. He'll have one scramble that goes for 17 yards that he evades a bunch of pass rushers. And then on a third and six on a couple downs later, um, he'll drop his head, try to make magic happen, and then take a loss of seven yards on a sack. So he just doesn't know when to do what, when to throw, who to look at. Maybe nothing's open down the field. It's just all wrong. And the Chicago Bears... Um, are probably the worst team in football through three games easily. Man, is there any saving grace? Like what like what did the no. Bears even do at this point? No. I mean there there isn't. It was it was truly 34 to nothing before you even like blinked your eyes. Yeah. And like people get excited for Roshan. It was Cleo Herbert and Roshan early on with pony personnel stuff. You can't play anyone on this team. You can't play anyone on this team. 
It's really that simple. Coming up for the Bears after this, we mentioned it. It's the Broncos and it's the Commanders. You have to see something in one of those two or else like Justin Fields, 0-5, you're going to have a top five pick, top one pick, and it's over. Like it's He's battling for his Bears career at this time. It's that simple. And to me, it looked like he got concussed. I don't. I, I yeah. saw him wobble around, and then he stayed in the game. I don't know how the NFL allowed that one to play in. Um, it's yeah. There's he, nowhere to go here. He did come off. DJ Moore pulled him from the huddle, like physically pulled him from the huddle when he saw how just wobbly he was. And they went ahead and just ran the ball and kicked a field goal after that. And then he came back in the next possession. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I agree with everything you said. I have no thoughts. I have no idea what to do with this team. You can't play Justin Fields. Even nope. though they are they are getting what would on paper be a great setup spot against this can't Broncos defense, you can't do it. I agree. Yeah, I mean, look, Rasheed Rice pops up here for five for fifty nine, but Blaine Gabbert like throws the football. You know, like it's uh, <laughs> how does Blaine Gabbert throw two interceptions on his five dropbacks in garbage time? Explain that. That's a good question. I, I don't know. The, uh, the the NFL might we might never see those plays on a, a television broadcast in NFL history. You hear about Jawan Taylor getting benched. That's what I was going to talk about. Yes. You hear about that in any other game uh, for misaligning on the offensive line three separate times. But in this game, you don't even hear about it because of the madness that was going on in Chicago's side. So I I think he has either six or seven penalties through the last two games. He had two more uh, illegal formation, like not having his head cross the belt of the center. I don't know if it was as egregious in this game as it has been like in previous years or previous weeks for him. I just think he is totally on the radar of refs at the moment. And if he is off by this or it's even close, they're throwing a flag on him. Mm -hmm. Like MVS had his first long touchdown wide open as a Kansas City Chief that we've been waiting for for a year plus. And it was pulled back because of uh, you know, he 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 wasn't set on the line correctly, Jawan Taylor. So he was benched at some point. I don't, I guess you can call it a benching. He was last week for a series as well, or a couple series, but like they're already up 34 nothing at the time. So it really doesn't matter. But it, it's it's one that he is pinpointed by referees that opposing teams have called it out. And it's gonna have to change, or else he's going to once again get these five yard penalties over and over and over again. Let's throw it back to Thursday night football and then finish it out with Sunday too. Giants versus 49ers. Man, there was some bad football this week. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers improved at 30 at uh, 3 and 0, uh, beating the New York Giants 30 to 12. So Brock Purdy's stat line looks amazing. 25 of 37, 310, two touchdowns. I think we can all say by watching that game, he was off target on a bunch of early passes in that first half, then make some crucial ones in the second half. And it just goes to show you that. This is, other than the Miami Dolphins, I would say that these are the best two teams in the NFL at the moment. Yeah, it's the the scheme, the play calling, all that stuff. Um, I agree, yeah. Brock Purdy left Debo Samuel up to dry a couple times, but Debo Samuel was just incredible this game. They got George Kittle out there, and then Brandon, you probably with the 10 days uh, of rest, probably going to come back next week. So it's it's the skill group plus the scheme will, will make Brock Purdy be kind of an upside quarterback to territory, depending on the matchup. But this was an outclassing of the Giants and the 49ers. I, I almost just want to attribute it to the Giants blitzing his head off and him having to cope with that and not mm-hmm. realizing that Wink's going to send the house on 86% of his dropbacks until finally he got a little more comfortable stepping up and taking hits. Even that big one to Debo's back shoulder for the touchdown was him stepping into a big hit and just launching it at the spot it needed to be. Yeah. I mean, I'm a huge Brock Purdy fan. Like, I, I think what he brings to the table with some of the twitch and that he – you know, plays quarterback with in comparison to Jimmy Garoppolo in terms of creating those plays that he couldn't is is a big addition to this team. But he was off on that first half. And this might be the worst football we see from him too, the longer he gets away from, you know, that that elbow surgery. Just quickly on the Giants end, um, we're all friends with Rich Rebar. I should have listened to him when he talked about the stacked matchups that Daniel Jones starts with to open a season. Um he called it the most difficult you know, passing schedule of any quarterback out there. I did not listen. I should have because, man, it's impacting this team, not just him, but like 
when your offensive line is dealing with a bunch of issues and you go up against a buzzsaw defensive line, it just throws everything out the window and you can't function. Like the Giants, there have been two games this year where like they cannot function offensively, and that's rough. And it doesn't help whenever you also lose two starting offensive linemen right. in the middle of that tearing matchups. Well, I will say on the offensive line, like they need those guys back. Like I'm looking at it right now, PFF grades. Uh, we had two players in the 20s. We had two other linemen in the 30s. And then Evan Neal was their best lineman per PFF grades at 45.3 grades. So like that's like unplayable levels across the board, all five spots. Regression hitting the Vikings and the Giants massively this season. I mean, and even when you factor in the two quarters that they've basically been horrible for 10 out of 12 quarters this season. Yeah. The New York Giants. So, and I know people were complaining about Darren Walsh's performance. And sure, I think what's happened though is that you just aren't like the Can't rest function. of the like the rest of the Titans in fantasy. I just don't think you're getting a consistent player. But then again, who is consistent? Because Darren Waller was the tight end four in week two, and no one was saying anything. And now all of a sudden, he doesn't deliver in this very tough matchup, and everyone's upset. Like you just you take the ebbs and flows of fantasy football. Panthers versus Seahawks. Seahawks improved two and one, being the Panthers now 0 and 3, 37 to 27. Kenneth Walker, 18 carries, 97 yards, two scores to go along with three catches for 59 yards. Hayden, I'm always going to bring it up. People say he didn't have hands. The people said he wasn't an efficient runner. And here we go. Kenneth Walker, top five running back in the NFL. Yeah, he's just been absolutely balling out. He's still not playing pass and downs, Josh. 12 routes on 41 dropbacks. But man, when he gets going, he really gets going. And I think what's most impressive to me about the Seahawks last two games is they're missing the offensive linemen and Geno Smith's just not getting hit. The sacks, he only takes, takes two of them here. Uh, Kenneth Walker could create a round bad offensive line. It's gonna He's going to bounce around. He might take a couple of negative plays here and there, but he can bounce it. Uh, for big plays here. So I think it's really impressive for the Seahawks without their two tackles still playing this well. And they have like this old school dynamic between Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonnet and Charbonnet pops up for nine carries for 46, where it really is like a thunder and lightning of the nineties and the two thousands backfields that really don't see across the NFL anymore. Yeah. I mean, Gino, Derek Brown, like had this awesome pass rush where he got instant disruption. Gino just like dances around him, breaks his ankles and throws it off his back foot. And, you know, we get six receptions for 112 yards for DK Metcalf. And the vast majority of that was, uh, was in the first half on the Panthers end. Andy Dalton's forced to throw the football 58 times. He does go for 361 yards and two scores. Um, Adam Thielen goes for 11 receptions and 145 yards and a score on 14 targets. Yeah, I mean, this is just going to be an outlier week, I think, in that performance. But at least the Panthers could generate something offensively, albeit probably their weakest opponent, I would say, defensively that they faced all season long so far. I still did not expect that 20% target share from Adam Thielen that you mentioned. But when you lose Jonathan Mingo mid-game, then yes, that makes their two wide sets pretty much set in stone with DJ Chark. Yeah. I will say the Panthers have lost some guys on defense that could like have trickle down effects. Like this team could be in garbage time all the time. We'll see if Bryce is going to be back, but I think like Andy Dalton and Bryce are fairly similar right now. So like, I think Adam Thielen, like the garbage time, it will not be pretty, but like he's, he's at least on the radar. You don't see this many targets and not at least be like on the flex radar. Yeah. And Panthers defensively lost Frankie Louvu, lost a couple of other pieces. We've known what they've lost in previous weeks. Uh, Miles Sanders did get a touchdown. Finally, Miles Sanders also got nine targets in this game, and that doesn't even include two more where he was split out wide, made the catch, and they were called back for penalties. Hayden, it's what you've alluded to where this team's struggling so much. Like, this was Miles Sanders' backfield entirely. Like, he owned it, and they're now trying to get him ways in the passing game as well. Um, five receptions for 38 yards. So I'm not going to say it's going to be successful, but it's not like Hayden Hurst, for example, where like Hayden Hurst had a great week one because Adam Thielen could not run with his ankle injury. I now think that because Adam Thielen is back to full health, Hayden Hurst is a non-factor in this offense. Yeah, and every single game, Miles Sanders has at least 18 opportunities. So it will not be pretty, but that he's mm -hmm. on pace for top 10 usage this year. And when Seattle's defense that was already allowing the third most yards for play in the NFL come into this one and allow Andy Dalton to go over 300 yards, you know you're in trouble moving forward. Here's my issue with the Panthers. Like, again, I do understand making the move up to get a quarterback. 
but you gave away your first round pick. You also now don't have any explosiveness at wide receiver. And now you're probably destined for a top five pick this season too. And we know that for agent wide receivers, unless it's T Higgins probably don't enter the market. And then I don't know how you're just going to like, obviously they are going to add to it, but the pathway is just much more difficult now after making the move up. Yeah. But that's what happens. That's what happens. Yeah. You don't have a first round pick to fix it next year. Yeah. But that's yeah. another massive upset. Somehow Jonathan Gannon's Arizona Cardinals. Cowboys versus Cardinals. It's funny about football is like, you think it was the Miami Dolphins, San Francisco 49ers, and like the Dallas Cowboys were making their way in that conversation. And then Hayden, they put this out there, a 28 to 16 loss to Arizona, who are one of the best first half teams in the NFL, could have easily won their first two games that they played this season. And then now they do close it out finally for fourth quarters, again, 28 to 16 over these Dallas Cowboys. I mean, NFL trying to predict this. I mean, it's, it's not easy to do. Um, yeah, I mean, just shout out for Gannon for having this team ready. Like, there's just lacking talent, and they're still getting chunk plays against a, a pass rush that I saw Michael Parsons getting his. But uh, James Conner, I mean, again, pays off. This is this is crazy stuff. So impossible to predict here, um, but embarrassing loss for the Cowboys for sure. Cowboys were one of only 17 offenses over the last decade that had scored on 70% of their red zone possessions. It scored a touchdown on 70% of their red zone possessions last year. Usually a number that regresses, falls backwards quite a bit. And we're seeing that with this offense right now. Struggled immensely in the red zone last week. That was their issues. Come back in this one, they score one touchdown on 25 red zone plays. Dak throws the game away with an interception inside the five-yard line at the end. It's right now... Although they're moving the ball efficiently between the 20s, right now when that field shrinks, they just have no answers but to hand it to Tony Pollard. You know, that's definitely on my radar. It's local writers are talking about it, national writers are talking about it, John Diggle's talking about it. It's worth noting that last year with Kellen Moore, this team had the best red zone touchdown success rate in the NFL. That's Donald Parham had two touchdowns inside the five-yard line today. You just figure out a way to make it work. And, and boy, it, it, it kind of really- seems like With the Cowboys, it's, hey, let's spread everyone out and run routes towards the middle of the field. And then Dak Prescott trying to thread the needle. Or like you're saying, it's Tony Pollard. And while we love that for Tony Pollard's usage because we've never gotten inside the 10-yard line carries, it's not working like it did last year. So Mm -hmm. that's an element that hopefully they can fix as they go along. And, you know, we're seeing good stuff out of them, like you're saying, throughout the 20s. But um, four-point plays or not turnovers are imperative to win football games and, like, to be a legit contender in the NFL. Um, and this yeah. was their debut without uh, Trevon Diggs, also yeah. missing three starting offensive linemen in this one as Tyron Smith was just kind of watching from the sideline, although he was suited up. So they are experiencing injuries right now. It's just a matter of how they bounce back. The thing is, and playing another easy matchup next week, correct? Patriots. Oh. Pay, uh, not, I guess not easy, but also um, hopefully you would think another get right spot, but we'll see because that was supposed to be this week. Yeah. For the Cardinals, uh, it's a buzzsaw of the NFC West. It's the 49ers, then the Bengals, and then the Rams and the Seahawks. And all three of those NFC West matchups are on the road. Just a quick thing. Colt is my guy. You know, we do a show every week. Hopefully you all tune into it. I am really over, though, the tanking aspect and the conversation around the Cardinals because... I think it was totally off saying that Um, it's clear that they just, to me felt more comfortable with Josh Dobbs because he has a history, which happens all the time. It happens in business. It happens in football and they are doing their best to win games on the field. I would say a lack of talent will eliminate them from doing that off the field. And it's going to take quite a long time to fix that. But Jonathan Ginn isn't calling plays defensively. He's obviously not the offensive play caller. He's an interesting person to get to know. Um, mm-hmm. But something's something's happening with the Cardinals. Like effort, we see we yeah we we see some bad teams across the league. And again, it stands out to me that they play hard in the first two quarters of every single one, and they're going to upset some teams, as we just saw this week. We'll close it out with what we'll call offensive football in a way Patriots versus Jets By offensive I mean offensive because we had to watch Zach Wilson throw 36 passes completing 18 of them for 157 yards taking three sacks as the New England Patriots 
beat the New York Jets 15 to 10. Um, sloppy. The Patriots are going to win via sloppy football this year. Yeah, I mean, they're, they had a chunk play. Pharaoh Brown gets uh, loose on a little busted coverage for a 58-yard touchdown. But aside from that, they didn't have any other plays uh, 20 yards or further. Ramondre Stevenson and Zeke Elliott are getting the rock a ton. Ramondre just is not going anywhere with those looks. And then this Kendrick Bourne, Devontae Parker stuff is just not going to work against Sauce Gardner and the Jets defense. So these are two defensive teams. This is not a surprise to anybody. Um, but the lack of explosiveness for the Patriots is just going to keep these games closer than they should be. Because we're not getting and explosive plays from Ramondre Stevenson anymore. Like that was mm -hmm. a major part of his profile last year. And now we're getting a 10 yard carry from him and then a long catch of three yards. And this is like back to back to back weeks. So we're not seeing anything explosive for Ramondre. He also had a first drop down in this game yeah. uh, that I think may have favored Zeke Elliott afterwards a little bit after that. Uh, and not to mention, I do think Zeke was still involved as heavily only because of the weather. Uh, the weather, everyone was worried about it coming into the game, and this is the one that it really affected. Just completely sloppy out there. But at the same time, the play calling, it's just boring unless we get volume. Like There were multiple third down situations where the only play call was a slant to Judas Smith Schuster. And guess what? That doesn't work out. And yet they kept on going back to it, allowing the Jets to creep back in with one big play. So it's just boring to watch them right now. Well, and it's awful to watch the Jets. Dalvin Cook, eight carries, 18 yards. I mean, Reese Hall, 12 carries, 18 yards. Garrett Wilson, nine targets, 48 yards. That's probably like the best you can do, to be honest. Like, it's... <laughs> That's you can't play these life. guys. Yeah. It's like the Bears and the Jets. You just can't play them. It's really that simple. Garrett Wilson will... scored a touchdown the past two weeks, and he still finished only the wide receiver 22 was his highest mark. Like He has scored a touchdown to even reach wide receiver 2 status. I will say, Josh, something to monitor. Brees Hall did play 31 of 63 snaps, so that's that's an improvement. I'm looking. I think we'll get a report from the Jets. They'll be like, Pelissero, like, we're ready to unleash Brees yeah. Hall. I think we might be getting closer to that. They always said like September, we're going to ease them in and then let them start cooking. So maybe Brees Hall is a buy low. I'm hoping the Jets say enough already with Zach and make a move for like Tannehill or somebody like that. Play like Tim Boyle. Just play Tim Boyle at this point. I mean, we're getting close to it. It's yeah. it's not pretty. The thing, I mean, it might happen against the Broncos in two weeks. It's not going to happen against the Chiefs. You know, they should just like let that one go <laughs> Don't as, show as much as teams do that. But, it, I mean, it, it's a tough stretch that they have, you know? Like, just good teams pop up. Eagles, then the Chargers, the Bills, the Dolphins. Like, good luck. It's it's just an unwatchable team. It's an I unwatchable mean, team. at what point do you lose the locker room, though? Like, you, like I, I think they, they said, I, I'm, I think they have, like they did last year. Right. You know? I mean, Gary Wilson was yelling at Dak Wilson. So Michael Carter was yelling at his position was, coach. Yeah. Like, Look, it's an awful concoction when it's Zach Wilson and Nathaniel Hackett as as your offense. And like, again, we talk about in our Q&A shows, we talk about in the, the tiers and rankings. The team is running the fewest plays in the NFL. They're projected for the fewest points in the NFL. They are trying to shade their quarterback and not like showcase him at all, to not show him off at all. And you can't play NFL football that way. You, you can't win games like that, but they have to because this is what they have. He was just, if it wasn't open down the field, he literally was turning behind himself and like looking for a free out, like as if the answer was behind him and then just taking sacks still. He just, he can't play. Robert Sala was asked after the game if Zach Wilson will start next week and he responded, quote, he's fine. <laughs> that was, that was the best he could come up with. Let's see. All right. That's going to do it. Daigle, I know that you're working on waivers as soon as this ends. Tell the people because uh, it's another big week. Some Quentin Johnson love potentially. Some other changes in backfields across the league. Tell the people where they can find it. Definitely a lot of flex options will be available in the waiver wire at 44.com. You can still use the promo code Daigle for 25% off to get in the redraft streets because you're probably looking at your team. And I would argue the number one season in your league right now, they probably have Tyreek Hill or some star players, but really – even their flex spots, wide receiver three spots, it's all just someone you wouldn't expect to be there. Like all of us are starting Brian Robinson, Josh Reynolds. Like we're starting these guys every single week because that's the point we're at right now. So the waiver wire column has all those players for you. Love that. All right. Hey, now we'll be back for Stats versus Film on Tuesday. We'll see you all then.
Thanks, Producer Weaves. Thanks, Dags. Thanks for four. Thanks to all of you. Up the velo. Talk to y'all soon. See ya.